for standing by. At this time, all parties will be on a listen-only <coughs> mode for the duration of today's conference. This call is being recorded. If you do have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to go in and turn today's call over to Ms. Dory Snedden. Ma'am, you may begin. Hello, thank you everybody for joining today's webinar on Title IV Prevention Program Implementation Update. Um, I, I'd like to mention that we'll have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar, um, but we would encourage you to chat your questions in during the presentation today. Um, we have a lot to cover, so I will turn it over to Jerry Milner, the Associate Commissioner at the Children's Bureau. Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Jerry Milner. I want to uh, thank all of you who've made the time to join us uh, this afternoon. We're really incredibly pleased uh, to see the level of interest uh, that uh, everyone has had in joining the conversation. Uh, this call was set up to support 500 lines, uh, and we reached capacity uh, for those lines pretty pretty early on. Um, we are planning, we will be recording this webinar just for your information, and we're going to make that available through our listservs and our website just as soon as we possibly can following um, today's call. Uh, for the webinar today, we, we've got very, uh, really just four very simple goals for our time together. Uh, one, we want to talk to you a bit about uh, our Children's Bureau vision and how that fits in with the Title IV-E uh, prevention program and how uh, you can make the best of the opportunities that the Family First uh, Act prevention planning process makes possible for you. We plan to highlight today two um, uh, prevention plans that have been approved. Uh, we have with us uh, Brenda Donnell, who is the director of the Washington, D.C. Child and Family Services Agency, Agency, and Cosette Mills, who will is the director of the Utah Division of Child and Family Services, who will discuss uh, their programs. Um, we also plan to provide some technical tips and areas for consideration as other states begin to develop their pro, uh, uh, prevention plans. And lastly, as Dory just mentioned, we will take any questions uh, that you might uh, have. Um, I, I hope that folks on the line at, at this point are aware that the Children's Bureau for about the past three years uh, has been aggressively promoting a vision uh, for child welfare in our country. This vision calls for reshaping uh, child welfare in our country. Uh, into a system that is very much focused on primary prevention uh, of child abuse and neglect and strengthening families and communities to reduce the likelihood that maltreatment will occur uh, for children. We've got two overarching goals uh, that are a part of this uh, vision. The first, as I've mentioned, is to prevent the need for families to ever have to make contact with the child welfare system in the first place. For us, this means working um, quite a bit further upstream uh, than we typically work in child welfare to prevent the imminent risk of children uh, uh, from entering foster care from ever actually occurring. The second goal connected to this is our desire to dramatically improve the foster care experience for children and youth that must be removed from their homes uh, must be removed from, um, from, their, from their parents. The Family First Prevention Services Act, as you know, fills a very important gap in allowing for some prevention efforts that are evidence-based to prevent children from entering the foster care system. We need that gap to be filled, and, and we're grateful to have it. We also believe uh, very firmly that children and families also deserve other things and de deserve the opportunity to get the support that they need as soon as possible before uh, more intensive efforts uh, of the child welfare system are actually necessary. We believe that, frankly, in the name of justice, uh, we should be doing uh, more for families sooner rather than waiting until the trauma or the imminent risk of trauma occurs. And, and we believe, based on conversations and discussions and site visits that we've had with so many of you, that you also share that vision with us uh, go, going uh, forward. With that in mind, uh, our challenge uh, to you all has been and continues to be to think very broadly when you're developing your uh, prevention plans under the Family First Act. 
As you know already from our guidance, uh, there are basic statutory requirements that every state must meet in the plans. But our challenge is you, uh, to you uh, today and, and, and in our ongoing work with you is to take the opportunity to use the Family First planning process to lay out a, a much more comprehensive plan uh, to reorient your system to be as proactive as possible, to be the kind of family well-being system that can provide healing to families and to children and to young people when that's necessary. The kind of system that strives to prevent trauma, not just to react to it and try to repair it, while that will also always be a necessary component. We can't require anybody uh, to take that approach uh, in your prevention plans, but we sure as heck want to encourage you as strongly as we can. One of the things that Family First offers us is that opportunity to bring our communities together, to bring stakeholders together, and, and to be very deliberative and thoughtful in how we want to plan to serve children and families uh, as, as we uh, go forward. Uh, one of the uh, ab absolute joys that I've had over the past couple of years is being able to attend so many Family First kickoffs in a number of jurisdictions around the, around the country. Those kickoff meetings and ongoing planning meetings are bringing together a, a real wide range of stakeholders to talk about what their families uh, and communities need, not just what they can do to meet technical requirements uh, in the legislation, but to think much more broadly about how communities can come together to strengthen the capacity and the abilities of, of, of families. These convenings, these meetings have been incredibly exciting, expiring. Um, particularly when they are inclusive of young people and parents who have lived experience uh, in the child welfare system, when they're including judges, attorneys for children and parents, kinship care providers, uh, and, and so many more. Um, we've been sending the message as loudly and consistently as we can uh, that we truly want the plans that states, territories, and tribes submit to be much, much more than simply compliance exercises, but to be living, organic, dynamic documents that will lead the way forward to better outcomes and better experiences for children and families um, in, in your state. We want you to think uh, of all of the planning processes as a way to bring people together, to amplify the voices of lived experience, uh, to draw upon your values, uh, and to form joint uh, visions for how you want families and children to experience uh, child welfare and child and, and family services in your jurisdictions. Uh, we do not believe that an accounting of what uh, evidence-based services you plan to provide from the clearinghouse really provides that vision. That is a requirement, but we want um, uh, for you to be able to relate that uh, to a much uh, broader vision if you possibly can. We believe that you've got an opportunity. We all have an incredible opportunity before us right now to bring a much larger vision uh, to life, and, and we hope uh, that you will uh, absolutely take advantage of this oppor opportunity. So I just want to thank you once again uh, for taking the time uh, to join us this afternoon. At this point uh, in our agenda, uh, we're, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brenda Donnell, who is the director of the Washington, D.C. Child and Family Services uh, Agency. We asked Brenda uh, to come in today to share some of the district's um, experiences in developing uh, the prevention plan. Uh, we have been just so incredibly fortunate um, because we happen to be conveniently located in her back door uh, <laughs> here in, in the district to be able to work closely with, with Brenda, her staff, her community of, of stakeholders as they've gone through this journey. And we just really could not be prouder uh, of, of what they've come up with. The district is, is a real example of a jurisdiction that's taken this challenge to heart and use the Family First planning process uh, to continue uh, an effort to reorient, to reorganize around strengthening families and communities in a very, very impressive way. And I know you're going to be impressed uh, with what uh, you uh, hear uh, today as well. When Brenda is, is done, uh, we'll move on to the discussion from Utah. But I'm going to turn things over to Brenda. Thanks so much, Brenda. 
Great. Thank you so much, Jerry, and thanks for letting me be part of this webinar to talk with um, colleagues all over the country and to hear from them um, about some of their questions and concerns. So I want to, um, knowing that every jurisdiction is different and there are numerous ways to approach the Family First planning process, I just wanted to share with everyone the approach that we took in the District of Columbia. We started with, we established a cross-agency, cross-sector work group, and the charge was clear that we wanted to create, as Jerry has said, a citywide plan to strengthen families and keep children safe. The Family First Prevention Services Act is an opportunity, not an end game. So we have um, a multi-stage process to develop our plan, um, as people can see. And we started our planning process in June of 2018, then submitted our plan to the Children's Bureau in April of 2019 and received final approval in October of that year. The reason that we were able to move so quickly was that our plan was built on a history of prevention in the District of Columbia and on the heels of our 4E waiver, which also focused on prevention. We had a comprehensive work group, and um, we were able to bring our partners together pretty quickly, again, because we've been working together on a number of these efforts. These are our partners that we work together with every day on multiple cross-sector work. We established three very short-term work groups to, one, give us a lay of the land in our existing upstream prevention programs. Secondly, to reach agreement on the most vulnerable populations that we are all concerned about. And three, to assess the district's portfolio of evidence-based practices and determine what else we needed. So I think this is really important. No one starts from scratch in this work. And every, as I said, every jurisdiction is different. But to take stock of where you are, who your partners are, where you want to go collectively, um, Again, we approach this not as just developing a plan, but as an opportunity to say, here's where we are in the district, here's what our 4E waiver allowed us to do, laying that foundation, and now where do we want to go and what are the needs. The, um, the result was that our plan is a very comprehensive plan, and looking at the pie chart, we, our big focus is on um, our upstream prevention, and that really is the vision that we want to meet families where, we, where they are and help them get to where they want to go, and that um, the plan we wanted to create would go beyond um, the narrow boundaries of the Family First um, Prevention Services Act, although we were very careful to align the Family First Act plan portion with the requirements of the Act thanks to many partners who kept us focused on that, because, of course, we wanted to um, take advantage of the opportunities that the Act um, offered in terms of new prevention services and strategies and claiming opportunities, but again, in the context of a broader citywide prevention plan. So we started looking at um, with our partners, and here, when I say our partners, where our Department of Behavioral Health, which um, focuses on mental health and substance abuse services, our Department of Health, um, which is the primary funder of home visiting, but also, of course, really focused on the social determinants of health, and um, in the district, very neighborhood focused. Our collaboratives in, in Washington, D.C., we have a network of um, community-based collaboratives that we've been working with for over 20 years. And, um, and then our Department of Human Services, primarily responsible for families who are experiencing homelessness and um, families who receive public benefits. We brought our partners together and said, who are the most vulnerable populations that you work with or that you are concerned with? Who keeps you up at night? And we relied very heavily on data. How many of these groups are repeat clients? Who is most likely to engage or drop out of services? Who hits multiple agencies? Which is some of the markers we use to come together. And um, no surprise, we were pretty, able, pretty quickly able to um, identify the most vulnerable populations that we, knew, we know we need to focus on um, deeper and stronger. 
So our, um, we looked at children who are, from the child welfare standpoint, who are already engaged in preventive services. For us, children who were referred to and receiving in-home services, those who have had a substantiation of abuse and neglect, but um, we made a decision based on risk, risk factors and the opportunity to provide services so they could be safely supported at home. Children who are referred to are receiving, receiving services from the collaboratives I mentioned, um, they may be, have a high risk level, but uh, not necessarily are substantiated. And then also children with cases closed following investigations or family assessments who are medium or high risk. And we looked at children with immediate family members in foster care, right? Again, looking at our data, who comes into our system, who is likely to get a repeat report. Children of foster youth, children of youth who recently exited care, and siblings of children in foster care, siblings who may not have been removed. And then children at risk for reentry, those who are exiting the permanency or have recently exited the permanency and needed additional support. So then we cross-reference these populations with the requirements of the Act. We in D.C. refer to these as our front porch and our front yard families. When we go upstream, that's our front yard, that's our further up the, up the stream or around the corner, but our front porch and front yard families. So we came together again with all of our partner agencies and um, our target populations, which we put into our plan and which were approved by the Children's Bureau, are some that I have mentioned, um, but also we went, we went a little bit deeper and got more specific. So we, uh, I talked about the children served through our collaboratives or children who have exited foster care. We also have a special focus for children who are born to mothers with positive toxicology screening as a definitely vulnerable population. And um, pregnant or parenting youth who are in foster care, but particularly the children of those youth once they have left us, we know are an important population. And then, as I mentioned, the siblings of foster care. So those are our primary target populations. and. In addition to the data, we um, looked at some additional criteria, like the risk level, the risk assessment score. We do have um, risk screening instruments, as most jurisdictions do, whether or not a substantiation was recent, the historic likelihood of entering foster care. And all of these informed our business processes um, to narrow down the population. So once we got our plan approved, um, well, let me back up. Even before we got our plan approved, and actually this is the, the most important thing, I think, in the planning process is we have the broad stakeholders and the building of the vision and the identification of the target population as part of our big planning process. At the same time, we started planning for implementation. I think this is critically important can't do the big vision and the lofty plan. We wanted to go October 1, and we did, even though our plan didn't get approved until later in October, but we had to build in the um, elements in our systems to make sure that we were ready to go. And I think you cannot underattend to this planning. Um, the three most critical areas, um, internal areas of focus were training, information technology, and our finance and revenue. And the, um, the, the circles that you see in the, um, in, in the chart represent internal stakeholders. So they were meeting on a regular basis um, while we were developing the plan. Uh, in terms of training, huge partner. And in DC, we have our own training academy, which is very fortunate. If others have external partners, then you would want to make sure that you have the training lined up, identified, resourced in ways that you can um, be ready to go day one. We made a decision um, in terms of one of our strategies and one of the um, evidence-based practices that we built in um, as a core component of our plan, and that's motivational interviewing. And for us, it's because, and I think it's everywhere, case management is the foundation to all services for the families we serve. 
So we decided to include motivational interviewing. This meant getting all social workers, as well as our community partners, trained and certified before October 1, which we did. We're betting on a favorable response from the Children's Bureau that motivational interviewing can be claimed for case management services beyond the clearinghouses rather than narrow, narrow designation. And we have that um, into the Children's Bureau as of last week. But even, even if that doesn't occur, and that's really for claiming purposes, um, we wanted to get everybody trained so that we have a core evidence-based um, case management model. And so that was training. The, um, and we also had to develop um, some new technology in terms of or had to enhance our SACWA system. And this was um, involved a lot of internal debate because we, like most other jurisdictions, are in stages of development uh, for the new um, CWIS development. And we're making decisions about how much do we build on an old system but there are certain things that you just have to do. So we decided it was an important investment to build in a tracking um, system um, within our current SACWIS. And that's because our model has families moving from the, um, the front porch through the front yard through the front porch and then on out the back door for ongoing services. And we need to track them through their prevention plan and be able to claim. So our community partners are part of this portal. So there's one prevention plan for each family. We hope for them it's relatively seamless. This allows us to track. So we thought that was huge. This was not without cost and um, moving some other priorities where we think it was a, a critical um, requirement. So we look back then to um, our prevention work group, because now we're in implementation, which of course is multi-year and will be refined and we'll be making changes along the way. But we want the, another important element of our plan is evaluation and continuous quality improvement. So we decided that our prevention work group, again, these are our partners from other agencies, and from our community partners, and we included, of course, the courts and our legislature, um, as well as providers, that in terms of transparency and accountability, that we want them to continue to have skin in the game. And we have built them in as feedback loops for our CQI process. So I think that is an also an important element as you're developing your plans and you don't do evaluation at the end, you're thinking all along about what is it that we're going to be capturing, not just in terms of data, but what are we looking for in terms of outcomes and where do, how and when do we need to make adjustments. I'll say that um, our prevention work group is very excited about being part of this process and um, we think it's a really, it was a, it was a smart um, decision, not on my part, but on my team's part to do this um, because, again, that they're at the table and they're holding us accountable, but they're also part of improving the whole process since this is a citywide prevention plan. And then, um, finally, I just wanted to end with a picture of how we're envisioning our CQI process, um, as I just said, includes our original planning group and um, shows that we're looking at our current state um, in terms of our initial plan, are the target populations being reached, what are the various disservices, are the programs being done correctly with fidelity. So all of those kind of process measures we, we have to pay attention to. And then do our service providers have the right support, the technology and training and capacity to be successful? Are there improvements? Then we're going to more to outcomes, improvements in mental health, substance abuse and parenting outcomes for families, and was child abuse or neglect averted. And as we started our plan with data, so we will manage our plan with data. And our goals is that our goals are that we have increased engagement, we have high of families, high quality services and service delivery, improve health and well being, and that we reduce child maltreatment. So thank you very much for allowing me to share where we are in the District of Columbia, and I look forward to answering questions later on.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brenda. And I would, uh, we would just encourage you again, if you have questions or comments, to um, put them in your chat box, and we can address them at the end of the presentation. Um, so I would like to introduce um, Cosette Mills, um, the Federal Operations Administrator for the Utah Division of Fam Child and Family Services, to talk about Utah's approach to their Title IV Prevention Program Plan. Thanks so much. I also appreciate the opportunity to participate in this webinar and to tell you about Utah's 4A experience with our 4A Prevention Program Plan. And one of the things we wanted to do today was contrast the different ways that these approaches can take place in different parts of the country. I'm going to briefly share some context about the approach and planning that we took, and then I'm going to talk a, a little more specifically about, about information specific to preparing the plan document, and then was also asked to comment related to working with our regional office. Um, if you want to move slides. Um, when the Family First passed, our leadership in Utah made a firm commitment to move forward with the prevention services provisions at the earliest possible date. We recognize that the 4 Prevention Plan does not reach the optimal level of prevention by preventing abuse and neglect from occurring in the first place, and that it is limited to preventing entry into foster care. But even so, our executive leadership said that despite this limitation, why would we not act on the opportunity to access additional resources to support vulnerable children and families at the earliest possible time? So we chose to move forward um, with that mindset, we did some analysis of our capacity and we re prioritized our resources so that we could um, target that October 1, 2019 start date for the prevention program, which then also meant we had to meet the QRTP provisions of the Family First Act. Um, we, a deliberate decision was made not to focus on the whole prevention program continuum at that time while we were actually preparing this plan, though we are working with that um, bigger system. It just wasn't part of our 4 prevention plan process. Um, next slide. Uh, we did build our 4E uh, pr prevention program on our 4 waiver homeworks. Our waiver focused on strengthening parents' capacity to safely care for their children, while also safely re reducing the need for foster care. And although the 4 Prevention Program can't fully replace the flexibility of our waiver, we see it as being able to help continue to build capacity to keep children safe in their homes. And because we, um, let's see, um, sorry, we're, I'm not quite to this slide yet, so um, sorry, we're tracking different slides. but. Um, because we uh, pushed for that early start, we decided initially to target services to the children who are already known as at risk in foster care. So those are children served in, the, in child welfare, but also children, youth in the juvenile justice system. And what we, the approach we took was to have our prevention plan become an opportunity to really build a foundation to implement all the provisions of the 4 Prevention Program, and then the goal is to expand over time. Um, like Washington, D.C. said, we also acknowledge that the 4 Prevention Program was really only just a small uh, slice of the pie of the overall prevention continuum, and we are working on that, obviously. Uh, you know, we, we agree that that's a wonderful vision, and we, we would love to put child welfare out of business that no kids are abused and neglected. Um, but in, you know, in the reality of now, we view the development and implementation of the prevention program and that broader prevention continu continuum as really being a marathon that we'll just need to push on over time, that it isn't a sprint. Um, so while we are expanding our, both our 4 program, we will also be working to further expand the full continuum. Thank you. Okay, let's now move to the planning process. Um, and you can go ahead one more slide. Thank you. Um, so the planning process for Utah's 4 Prevention Plan was directed by an executive steering committee that served as the governing body for implementation. 
and that executive steering committee was at our department level for the Department of Human Services, under which both child welfare and juvenile justice reside. The actual planning and implementation was managed by an implementation team or a project management team that included representatives from child welfare, juvenile justice, and other offices in our department that support service development and contracts. And then we also had work groups who targeted specific areas. Um, for example, we, um, in prevention, we had a work group for program operations that focused on developing the definition of candidates, what changes needed to occur in CWIS, what program policies needed to change, training, regional implementation, and finance. In service development, we explored what more specifically client needs, analyzing options around EBPs, assessing availability with providers, and initiating process, the processes to stand up EBPs. And we really feel like we started without a strong foundation of EBPs in our state. So we're, we're really starting um, from the bottom and building from there. Um, the next slide. So we, we did involve key staff and partners from the start that we knew was critical. So we had to include our program staff, our CWIS, our data, our evaluation, um, CQI staff, finance, procurement, training, um, a wide range variety of our internal process folks. But we also engage stakeholders in a variety of ways, such as our legal partners, our providers, our youth and parents and other partners who are essential to our system of serving families in our state in the broader child welfare system. And stakeholders were involved in a variety of ways, such as through participating in our work groups. Um, we did some surveys with them. We did some local focus groups um, and other informal meetings and, and informational meetings as well. We also engaged our research partners early in the process. Um, they are assisting us in three primary ways. They're helping us. We are initiated them um, some actual research studies to help us develop, look at some of, um, some of our services to have them become be designated as evidence-based. So we're looking at um, an in-home parent skills program that we did under our waiver and also kinship navigator services. Also, the, our university partners do conducting some independent systematic reviews for us to help identify evidence-based services pending the um, clearinghouse reviews, and also helping us to develop the evaluation strategies for those EBPs that are going to require evaluation, both development of the strategies and then conducting the evaluations. for. So any services that the clearinghouse has reviewed and determined is um, are promising or supported, and also for services that were rated through the independent systematic review. Um, some of the major planning efforts, um, and the next slide, um, say some of the major planning efforts that we focused on was we're really looking at what was the scope of the project, how were we going to define candidates, what services were we going to include, um, assessing our client needs. One of the ways we did that was through our Utah Families and Children Engagement Tool, which is a CANS-based tool that we use um, that was developed under our waiver to serve both um, in-home clients as well as uh, children in, in foster care. We also looked at our geography. We're a pretty, um, a pretty large state geographically and have um, a lot of uh, we have you know, some major urban areas, but we also have a lot of rural areas and some that would even be considered frontier. And so we did some heat mapping on needs and also looking at what existing services we had to try to identify where we needed to target. We did some assessment of existing evidence-based programs and then looked at with our providers community what evidence-based programs might they be interested in standing up. Also, another thing we did um, is to look at what, it was, what does it really take to stand up evidence-based services and what, what resources are available through developers, what would that cost. And we utilized some of our waiver funds and some other department funds targeted to expanding services to help with, with some of those startup costs. 
and anticipate now with the passage of the Family First Transition Act that some of that funding will continue to be used to help us with standing up those services. And where possible, we're utilizing existing systems to make implementation more feasible in that short time frame we were targeting. So for example, where we could, we used existing tools to assess safety and risk and also client needs, and we use, utilize those tools to determine candidacy. Um, and where, we, where possible, we also did automated those determinations through our um, CWIS system. We do anticipate that as we expand to additional services and, and expand beyond our existing child welfare population, that we will have need to expand to broader candidate population or to develop new tools and resources to support that. Um, Okay, next, if we could go to the plan document. Um, we're going to be, I'm going to just share a few specifics about some of the choices Utah made specifically related to development of the actual 4 prevention program plan document. Um, as we mentioned, jurisdictions have taken a variety of, pr of approaches in preparing their plans. So I'm just going to share some of the choices Utah made. When we looked at the program instructions for the prevention program, um, PI 1809, um, we, we kind of decided it was a cross between a traditional 4A plan, preprint, and the Child and Family Services Plan, APSR narrative documents. And keeping that in mind helped us as we tried to decide exactly how we were going to approach development of the plan. Um, and also, you know, in contrast to DC, to Washington, D.C.'s plan, where they uh, reflected their overall prevention vision, we made a de deliberate decision to limit our plan, keep it modest in scope, and only focus the plan document on the portion of our work that pertains specifically to the Title IV e prevention program. So we, we chose to have our 4 e prevention plan be just that, the plan to operate the 4 e prevention program, and not to have this document be where we would represent our overall vision of prevention and the work we're doing for prevention beyond um, this prevention plan. We also, um, obviously, we wanted to meet the federal requirements for the plan, but we also wanted to develop a plan in a way that became a meaningful and useful tool for us. So we created our plan with the intent to start small and to expand over time. For one example of that is we created a broad definition for candidates for foster care, but then we chose initially to implement it more narrowly. Um, and one thing we've tried to be really mindful of in, in uh, as we planned and as we're thinking about the scope of our services is that while we did create a, a more broad definition of foster care candidates than our current in-home services population under child welfare, we want to be really mindful that we don't put children whose families are struggling on a trajectory for foster care through the 4 prevention program if they wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, thanks. If you go to the next slide. So we made some intentional choices in preparing our actual plan document. Um, we, we wanted the plan to be as easy as possible to review and to approve. So we chose to follow the program instruction very precisely. Um, for example, the order of the sections of our plan matched the PI specifically, and that we used the exact same headings that were in the PI. And then as we wrote the content of the plan, we wanted to ensure that we addressed the specific content that was being asked for in a way that would be clear and understandable. Um, we also didn't include anything in our plan that wasn't specific to the 4 prevention program. And again, this is a contrast to what some other uh, jurisdictions have chosen to do. We didn't include any services that we're providing to um, clients if they weren't covered under 4 So we didn't specify them in this specific plan. Um, we also, uh, for our initial submission, we decided to limit it only to well-supported services that had been identified by the clearinghouse that wouldn't also require evaluation or the independent systematic review. And part of that goal was so that we could get a foundation of a plan approved and begin to operate the program and the services and make sure everything was working and then be able to submit those more challenging pieces that, that um, we were seeing were more difficult to work through. Um, 
So in a subsequent amendment, um, we haven't we have a, are um, including services that do require evaluation and also um, it, uh, that will require independent systematic review. And then we'll work um, with our federal partners to work through the details of kind of really learning what's approvable in, in those um, areas. Um, we did have one service we submitted for an independent systematic re review that then um, was a, on Friday we got notice of its rating and so we're amending that amendment to, uh, to indicate that it was a service approved by the clearinghouse. So, th so there is some back and forth and some adjusting because it's, this is very much a, um, you know, a plane in motion that we're kind of uh, modifying as we go. Um, also, we carefully analyzed the preprint document and realized it wasn't necessarily like a traditional preprint. Not everything in the preprint requires the citation of um, laws, regulations, or policies. In some sections, we, we referenced the attachments that were required to be submitted. Um, and there were some sections that it was just not applicable not applicable, there was no regulatory reference that was required. So that's something that's a little different than, your, than our traditional preprint documents. Um, we also just tried to be really specific about addressing each of the required elements for the plan. Um, and then there were some sections that we had to modify to address in more detail than we initially understood would be required. So there are some areas that have needed a little more detail than um, was initially evident. So a couple things I would just mention on that is be sure to indicate for the services that are being implemented which specific version of the manual that we're planning that are, is planning to be implemented. And also as you're thinking about outcomes, I know that at least for us initially we were thinking of broad outcomes to the overall implementation of prevention, the prevention services, but um, we needed to step that back and look at what are the outcomes to each specific service that we're proposing. Also, there are a lot of details about each specific service that need to be included, which category of evidence-based service it is, what the target population is, how our, what our plan is for implementing that, and how we're going to monof, monof, uh, monitor that specific service for fidelity and what our CQI activities will be for that service. Also, again, for those services that require an evaluation strategy, we couldn't submit a general evaluation strategy overall, but needs to be specific to each individual service. And then um, the next slide, um, just a few t t final tips is some things we learned based on our initial submission of the plan. Um, I'll reinforce again the importance of differentiating between our CQI and fidelity activities and the formal evaluation of services. Um, they, they are different functions and, and each needs to be clearly articulated. Again, and I mentioned earlier that they do need to be specific for each service and not just a general overall CQI or evaluation plan. Um, where possible for the CQI processes and the fidelity processes, we we looked at whether or not the developers of the services had already um, created tools and resources. And where we could, we opted to use those. Where those were develop available, we are working with our evaluators to help us, as part of the evaluation process, to deve develop some specific fidelity monitoring tools that we'll be able to implement uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, also, um, if you're requesting a waiver for evaluation for a service that was rated as well supported by the Title IV Prevention Services Clearinghouse, it's really important that, to analyze and articulate why it's compelling um, not to conduct a formal eva evaluation of that service. It was helpful for us to stop and really think about our services and our population and what other evidence is out there of the um, effectiveness of the service to be able to articulate that. We did find that a variety of clearinghouses and developer sites could help, was, was able to help us as we did that analysis and then also helped us in writing that justification. And again, for those programs that do require the evaluation strategy, we need, we need to provide a detailed evaluation for each program. Um, 
The Children's Bureau tip sheet provided in August of 2019 was an excellent resource. Um, it's that we've our, uh, we worked with our evaluators to look at that tip sheet as well as what the, the processes were for clearinghouse review as we thought about what it means to have an evaluation that um, will be effective for those services. The other thing that we've tried to do with our services is to ask the question, what are we really trying to accomplish with evaluation? Are we needing to try to add to the body of evidence to maybe we want to see if we can help support increasing the rating of a specific service? Or is it is the purpose for a given service maybe just to look at what specifically is the benefit to our own clients and our own process evaluation? I think the answer to that question helps to guide the research design and the rigor and the cost of the evaluation. Um, we, we haven't yet worked through the details with um, our federal partners in terms of evaluation, so <clears throat> anticipate that we have more to learn in that area, but those are things that have helped us in preparing that part of our plan. And then just our, uh, the last point we were asked to talk about was just sharing something about our, our interactions with our federal regional office through this process. Um, we did communicate very frequently with our regional office and they were extremely helpful. We did submit many, many questions to them, and they were very helpful in getting us responses to those questions in all aspects of the Family First implementation. We also discussed with them the process for submission and review, and they gave us information about the timelines, kept us informed so we knew where our documents were in the process. Um, and then um, when we had items that needed further attention, we, they worked with us to identify how we needed to address those items and, and make modifications to our plan submission. And then um, they've also helped us with next steps. Um, for example, what steps to take when we needed to submit our first plan amendment where that wasn't specifically addressed in the program instructions. Um, so we, we, for us, our federal regional partners have been um, really an important to the process and have been tremendously helpful. Um, and again, thank you for the opportunity to participate, to share some information and thoughts today, and I'll turn the time back now to the Children's Bureau. Great. Thanks so much, Cosette. And um, thank you to Brenda and Cosette for the valuable insights into um, developing the plans. I think a lot of the themes that you just talked about will be echoed in this next part of the presentation. So in this next part of the presentation, we'll be providing technical tips and areas for consideration that we hope will be helpful in the development of your plan. As Jerry mentioned at the top of the webinar, these tips and areas are really based on questions that the Children's Bureau has received and common areas of feedback that we've provided. Um, on submitted Title IV-E prevention plans. Um, and just to, to, to note that really we were intending these tips to be for those who are developing um, and preparing their plans um, for their state or jurisdiction. So um, on this slide, you see the nine areas that represent these broad topical areas required for the 4 e prevention plans. Um, this is, Part of the presentation is intended to be brief and specific, pretty specific. Therefore, we're not covering all the areas. Um, for a comprehensive review of the components, you can um, review the program instruction 1809. And, and at the end of the webinar, we're going to provide um, a resource list, and the link to this PI will be in there. Um, today, we'll be providing tips in the areas of service selection, child safety, continuous monitoring, and evaluation as well as a review of resources um, related to the independent systematic review process and the Title IV Clearinghouse. And finally, we'll briefly discuss the review process and working with the regional office and members of the integrated team. Um, so first, I'll provide a few tips related to service selection. Um, so the first technical tip in this area addresses allowable programs and services. Allowable programs or services include two categories. The first um, are those that have been rated by the Title IV Clearinghouse as promising, supported, or well-supported. Um, and this information is provided on the Clearinghouse website. 
Um, the second category of allowable programs or services are those that have been approved, have an approved designation um, through the independent systematic review process. And this information is provided on the Children's Bureau Title IV Prevention Program website. Um, to note, adaptations of EBPs are allowable, but they have to have their own review and approval to meet one of the two criteria above. Um, tip two is one that Cosette mentioned. Um, it's a technical tip um, in the areas based on feedback that CB has commonly provided to submitted plans. And that's that the prevention plan should include information about the book, manual, or other available documentation for each program or service which the state is requesting claiming reimbursement. Um, this is, this is uh, basically a reference. Um, and for programs that have been approved or rated by, and are rated by the Clearinghouse, this information is directly available on the Clearinghouse website. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and finally, the third tip in this area is related to claiming. Um, we heard from DC and from Utah the importance of um, really thinking about the needs in your state and um, the larger prevention continuum. Once the Title IV agency has identified programs and services that they want to include, um, in their prevention continuum, there are multiple strategies states can take in developing their Title III prevention program plan. Similar to DC's approach, states can provide a broad picture of the overall prevention continuum to include both programs and services for which the agency is requesting claiming, as well as programs in the larger prevention continuum. Um, the tip here and, and kind of the important point is just that the agency has to really closely follow the preprint and be clear about which programs and services the agency is requesting for reimbursement. Um, and on this next slide is really just a reference um, for a, kind of an ease of reference. Um, we're providing really specific information, just how to locate the book, manual, or available documentation for each program or service, as discussed on the previous slide. Um, and then also, how to find the status of submitted independent systematic reviews to claim transitional payments, um, also discussed on the previous slide. Um, just to note, CB, um, our website um, on the Title IV prevention plans, um, it it's, uh, includes all links to relevant documents. Um, next, I'll provide some technical tips on safety monitoring. So this next area of prevention plans is monitoring child safety. The tips included are in two areas. The first is monitoring child safety during the 12-month service period. And the second is reexamination of a child prevention plan. Um, tip one is that the prevention plan should include information specific as to how the Title IV agency will complete periodic risk assessments during the 12-month period. For it, for example, this can include instruments or protocols used for monitoring child safety, time periods or intervals for assessment, and the relationship with the um, contracted providers in assessing child safety. Um, next, tip two, um, the Title IV prevention plan should include information on how the child's prevention plan will be reexamined if the state determines the risk of the child entering the foster care system remains high despite the provision of services. This may include determinations regarding appropriateness of intervention and decisions regarding case closure. Monitoring child safety um, of children within the prevention context may differ from existing child safety measurement strategies and include coordination with contractors that are implementing evidence-based programs. These relationships in measuring and assessing safety are important and should be discussed in the prevention plan. Um, next, I'll turn it over to Kara Kelly to discuss tips related for, uh, to continuous monitoring. This area, continuous monitoring, is commonly known as continuous quality improvement, or CQI. Many Title IV agencies will be implementing new programs or services for the first time through their prevention program plans. Hence, an important component in developing a prevention plan includes information as to how the proposed evidence-based programs and services will be implemented into the Title IV agency's existing CQI infrastructure. The technical tips in this area fall into three main categories. The first technical tip in the area of monitoring and implementation is to ensure that information is provided in the plan regarding the implementation strategy for each proposed program or service 
the special consideration for implementation needs with rural communities, tribal partners, and contractors that may be implementing the evidence-based programs. The second technical tip in this area is to address in the plan how the Title IV agency will ensure fidelity to the practice model for each program or service. In the area of outcomes, the first technical tip is to describe how the agency will determine how CQI outcomes will be achieved. For example, outcomes such as safety, permanency, and well-being, as well as individual and programmatic level outcomes is appropriate. The second tip in this area is to describe mechanisms for gathering, organizing, and tracking information and results over time in the agency's CQI system. This could include information regarding the use of instruments or administrative data, adaptations to the state SACWA system or CWA system, or coordination with community partners. The final area is the development of a continuous feedback loop. The tip in this area is to provide information in the plan as to how the Title IV agency will use the information learned during CQI in driving change within the organization in order to improve outcomes for children and families. It's important to differentiate CQI from program evaluation as the two are closely related However, each have distinct components and should be differentiated in the prevention plan. Next, I'll describe the evaluation component of the prevention program plan. The requirement of a well-designed and rigorous evaluation falls into two main categories. In the area of a well-designed and rigorous strategy, the first tip is to ensure that the proposed evaluation meets the legislative requirements of well-designed and rigorous, and that the proposed strategy is comprehensive. We'll discuss the components of a well-designed and rigorous evaluation in more detail on the next slide. In the area of evaluation waivers, the tip is to ensure that the Title IV agency requests a waiver of the evaluation requirement only for programs or services that have been rated as well-supported by the Title IV Clearinghouse. Programs with an approved well-supported designation through the independent systematic review process are not eligible for a waiver of the evaluation requirement. Next. For every program or service that the agency submits a waiver for, the plan must provide evidence of the effectiveness of the practice to be compelling. Compelling evidence can include, for instance, a description of how each well-supported program or service has demonstrated effectiveness with the child welfare population in your state or jurisdiction, or information demonstrating that the evidence of effectiveness crosses more than one target domain, such as across child safety and child well-being. It's important to note that continuous monitoring strategies we discussed earlier remain a requirement for each program or service, even if a request to weave the evaluation requirement has been approved. We'll now move on to the evaluation strategy itself. The following area is very brief in the interest of time and provides a high-level overview of some of the important components of an evaluation strategy. In the area of evaluation components, the tip is that the proposed evaluation strategy for each program or service included in the prevention plan should be rigorous and well-designed. But what does that mean? For example, the proposed strategy should include research questions that are specific to each program or service being evaluated. These should map to the proposed outcomes of the evaluation. The target population should also be summarized to include information on items such as demographic characteristics or risk factors, eligibility or screening criteria, and information as to why the population was targeted for the evaluation. The proposed research design and methodology is up to the discretion of each individual Title IV agency and should logically map to the proposed research questions and outcomes. The design should be rigorous and provide details as to the type of design proposed. For example, whether a quasi-experimental design or a randomized control trial are proposed. The evaluation design should also include a data collection plan. This plan can include the procedures and protocols to collect and compile data, the intended respondents for each data collection method, and the frequency at which data collection will occur. Information on the sampling strategy should be included as well and provide information on sampling methodology and inclusion and exclusion criteria. In addition, the evaluation plan should also include a data analysis strategy that describes whether quantitative or qualitative data will be used and information regarding the proposed analytic strategies. Finally, the evaluation strategy should clearly articulate the study limitations for each proposed evaluation strategy to include any potential weaknesses or limitations of the selected research design, data collection, or analysis methods. A second important tip in this area is to ensure that the evaluation strategy is aligned from beginning to end, from the proposed research questions to the design, data collection, and analytic strategy. 
While you're developing your evaluation strategy, we want to encourage you to utilize ACF resources, including the Evaluation Plan Development Tip Sheet and the Program Manager's Guide to Evaluation. Information about these documents will be provided at the end of the webinar. We'll now move on to discussing the independent systematic review process. The independent systematic review process provides a time-limited opportunity for states to claim transitional payments for services and associated costs until the Prevention Services Clearinghouse can review and rate a program or service. The Prevention Services Clearinghouse makes the final determination about whether a program or service is assigned a promising, supported, or well-supported rating. During the development of the independent systematic review, there are several resources available from ACF, including Program Instruction 1906, and the Title IV Clearinghouse Handbook of Standards and Procedures. A list of the approved independent systematic reviews and those currently under review are available on the CD website discussed earlier and are provided here on the slide. In the area of submission and approval, the tip is to ensure that the independent systematic review is submitted as part of a Title IV Prevention Program plan. The review can only be approved as part of a Title IV agency's prevention plan. Next, we'll talk briefly about the Prevention Services Clearinghouse website. The Title III Prevention Services Clearinghouse website is an excellent resource to obtain information about programs that have been rated by the Title IV Clearinghouse, to access descriptions of programs and services, as well as to obtain information about the review process. The website also has a number of frequently asked questions. The frequently asked questions include the working list of programs and services currently under review. The Frequently Asked Questions list is updated regularly and includes questions regarding reviews, adaptations, and timelines. The Clearinghouse continues to review programs and services, and ratings for new programs and services will be released on a rolling basis. The Prevention Services Clearinghouse recently released another batch of programs and services, so please visit the Clearinghouse website for more information about these new releases. If you're interested in receiving regular updates and activities occurring at the Clearinghouse, you can sign up on the website to receive regular emails regarding updates and activities. So I'll go ahead now and turn it over to Tina Nogler, Director of Regional Programs, to discuss the review process for the Title IV Prevention Program Plan. Great, thank you. So this is a great opportunity to share with everyone Children's Bureau's integrated team process for the 4 um, Prevention Plan. We have a great teaming approach in which the CV Regional Office um, Program Specialist and the CV Central Office Specialist under the OCAN team and the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation Specialist all work together as a team to review prevention plan submissions. The teaming approach allows us to utilize all of our expertise to ensure a comprehensive review and a thorough feedback to all of you. So while we have this teaming approach for plan submissions, the regional office remains the main point of contact for jurisdictions working on the prevention plans. So if you have any questions or concerns before or after plan submission, you should always reach out and contact your regional office with any questions you may have. Loud? Okay, louder, sorry. Um, so when you're ready to submit a prevention plan, please submit those through your regional office. And as you, Tom, mentioned, it's really important, that communication. We um, do this frequently during the process, and we really want to work closely with all of you on your prevention plan submissions and questions. All right, so I'll turn it over to Jerry. Turn it over to me. Okay, so we are at the point now where we will uh, take questions and answers. Uh, for those folks on the line who uh, would like to uh, ask questions. So um, at this time, we have the phone lines muted, but we have uh, gathered questions from the chat function. So if Brenda wouldn't mind starting us off with reading the questions that have been submitted and then providing a response. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, Several people have written to ask if they could get copies of our plan, which we have shared widely. Um, you can go on our website, uh, cfsa.dc.gov, and our plan is on there. And if people have questions, we have a place where you can ask um, questions and certainly can reach out to me or members of my team. Um, someone asked, if, how does DC envision linking motivational interviewing directly to children on prevention plans as prevention candidates. 
And um, again, our approach to motivational interviewing is that it's fundamental to case management since it is focused on engaging families um, better, and that is um, something that we all have to do. But our hope is that it gets approved as a, um, as a well-supported service for, um, that we can use for case management um, claiming purposes. So we will, we're using it for everything, our kids in care as well. Um, there is a qu several questions about how to get everyone um, who needs to be at the table to the table. And this is where um, differences in jurisdictions and relationships really come to bear. But I think part of it is um, really helping people to understand that prevention is everybody's responsibility. and. If we don't, as jurisdictions and multiple systems, invest in, um, in prevention in a collaborative way, then we're all going to see our kids ending up in the deep ends of the system, which are not good for them, is not good for any community. And so really helping um, key stakeholders to understand that this is not a, just a child welfare issue, it's a child and family well-being. And, um, you know, again, that depends on where you start in your particular jurisdiction, but um, that's really, really important um, is, is helping to communicate that. Um, I'm going to bounce the question to you, Cosette, because there are some questions just for Utah and some for both of us. But um, this one says, given that Utah offers extended foster care to age 21, and re-entry into foster care until 21, is Utah considering whether to include older youth in its candidacy definition? Um, we, we limited the candidacy up to age 18. We did not put it up to age 21. And I'll answer that. We, the, um, DC has always had kids until um, age 21. Candidacy for us is under age 18 because you cannot come into foster care. You couldn't be at risk of coming into foster care if you were older than 18. However, we do include um, the children and therefore their parents of children of um, foster youth. So a foster youth who has aged out is a part of a family with a child who is part of our target population. So that was very, very specific, but we think really important. Um, Jose, is another question. This is for both of us. I'll bounce it to you first. Um, it's asked about what stage in the planning process was your child welfare policy updated and disseminated to staff? I, I mean, the development of, of it occurred as we went along. We, we, uh, we actually, so we finalized it just shortly before we submitted the plan because the policy did have to be attached to the preprint, the attachment B. So we had finalized the policy um, prior to submission of the plan itself. And then with that, had a rollout to our staff um, throughout the state you know, to, to uh, educate them on the policy itself. Yep, similar to the, the mm -hmm. district. Um, another question is um, about engaging um, judges and the courts. I look to David Kelly, who's in the room, <laughs> um, who is always a big advocate for that. I, I will say that we did invite um, our judges to be part of the plan, or our um, presiding judge of family court to be part of the planning process. And um, our courts found that they are not. Um, they're so interested, I shouldn't say interested, but their jurisdiction is not so much on the prevention side, even though, of course, it is in terms of some of the other um, elements of the act. And um, we, fortunately, in the district have very, very few kids in congregate care. So our focus really has been on our front porch and front yard, which does not really come to the attention of our court. So there it's about the kids who are going home and post-permanency kinds of services, if we can 
shorten um, length of stay by having um, robust services on the back end, that's pretty much where our courts are involved. But Utah may be different. Um, yeah, thanks, Brenda. We did uh, get involved with our court, court improvement program very early on, as soon as the law passed. Um, also, of course, participated in some of the strategic planning meetings together in Washington, D.C. Um, and we have worked closely with those partners, um, obviously heavier relationship related to QRTP, but they, they did have an interest, and I think particularly because for where if the in-home services clients um, were in child welfare, then there were many cases where we would have court jurisdiction. And so as we developed these, we you know, included those partners in the discussions and in the planning, in the vision, and also in training. We've, they invited us to come and you know, once we got the plan pulled together and the QRTP provisions, we have gone out and, um, and done presentations to judges, to guardian ad litems, to parental defense, um, so that they would know what was happening in Utah and would be aware of it. And, and also have opportunities to give feedback as we moved along the way. Also, we, um, where legislation was required, they were involved as well. And this is, this is David from the Children's Bureau. I, I would just add that um, we've seen uh, in a number of states during our, our visits, um, judges and attorneys for parents and children being very actively involved in discussions around planning and identifying both populations of needs and specific needs within populations. Um, by, by virtue of their, their position on the bench, judges have um, kind of a unique experience to look back over the life of the cases that come before them and see all the missed opportunities and are really, I think, well positioned to help identify um, what might have been helpful to families. And, you know, some of those are very clearly evidence-based services and then others are more community-based supports. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're useful in whether you choose to do a, a kind of a broader based planning approach or um, kind of a, a more narrowly tailored one. Um, there's another question regarding the use of the um, transition grant funds and um, specifically the question is how can stakeholders be involved in, and it's a great question. In DC, we back to our planning group, we're bringing them back to the table to help us think about now, we have some additional resources. What are some gaps we need to fill in? And so we have our plan and our, our candidate population and the services for those um, target groups. And then we also have our upstream um, prevention um, in DC is in the form of family success centers. But there are lots of other gaps. Mm -hmm. And so this, for us, we see as an opportunity to fill in some gaps and because we believe we assemble the right group of folks around the table representing the right organizations and key stakeholders, they're the ones that will help us to determine what those gaps are. So it's a very exciting time for us in the district because now we can not necessarily go further upstream, but we can um, we can go deeper upstream. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Kosad, did you have any have you all started focusing on the transition? Uh, we have, and I would say very similar. I went back to our initial planning group, have been doing more in-depth analysis, looking at um, where are the gaps from our waiver, what, what are we, you know, where are we in startup of new services, and how can we help invest these funds to help make it less um, difficult for providers to get on board? So what costs can we pick up now? over a period of time. But we're, we are still early in the planning to decide exactly where, where we're going to target. Um, but again, I think this is a wonderful opportunity. And there's one question about um, the changes that we made to our, um, our SACWA systems um, for the client level prevention plan requirements. And um, the question is about integrating did we integrate into existing case practice documents um, and are therefore requiring caseworkers to complete information for all children, regardless if they are eligible for the 4E prevention program? And for us, I think the answer would be yes, because we have a pretty 
um, and we were able to have a pretty broad definition for our candidacy population and knowing that um, even if they're preventing kids may come in and out of the system or touch the system in different ways. And so we decided that everyone would have the prevention plan. It would be the, the same plan that could track Metro Okay, great, thank you. So we have a couple of questions about the clearinghouse. Yeah, uh, one of the questions uh, was what website was it that we can request to receive email updates? So the preventionservices.appsite.com. Um, learn more. It has a link for you to join our email list. So please, we welcome you to join, and then you will really receive email updates. Uh, we have also gotten a few questions about how to recommend a program or service for review. We have an FAQ on the website itself on how to recommend a program or service for review. Um, just as an overview, um, the Clearinghouse uses a inclusive process for this, and so programs and services are identified through public calls on an annual basis. Um, the first public call was in fall of 2019, and then um, the Clearinghouse takes all of those recommendations. I believe we got over 400 wow. unique submissions, um, so wow. that's even more recommendations, I'm sure, in there. Um, and those are logged and kept by the Clearinghouse. Um, there were also recommendations in response to the 2018 Federal Register Notice and federal partners and other key stakeholders, as well as an environmental scan of the literature. Um, just so you know, all of that is kept, and we look at it often. The Clearinghouse looks at it in order to determine who, what programs and services will be reviewed next. You should note that particular consideration is given to programs and services recommended by state and local government administrators um, and rated by other clearinghouses such as CBC or Home B, recommended by federal partners, and are evaluated as part of any grant supported by the Children's Bureau, such as the Title IV Child Welfare Demonstrations or the Regional Partnership Grant. Thanks for those questions. Okay, great. There's one other question for DC and or Utah. Uh, the question is, uh, would you be able to discuss how and or when you began to engage IT staff to discuss system implications and teams? As I said, this is DC. We started a parallel process with um, our implementation work group. So they were pretty much at the table or at another table day one, so early in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that's true for Utah as well, that we had um, business analysts from our, um, our CWIS team participating in the work groups right from the beginning um, so that they would be know the conversations and direction we were going and be able to um, help. Because the time frame was really short for the, for the um, SACWIS or CWIS system programming. Um, so, yeah, we involved them right from the start as well. On the slide deck now, you see resources that are available from the Children's Bureau. And just to note that the Children's Bureau has created a specific page for Title IV Prevention Plan. On that page, we provide regular updates as to when states have, or tribal um, jurisdictions have submitted a plan, as well as submission through the transitional payment TI process. At this time, we will just acknowledge that there have been additional questions that have been submitted through the chat box that we will address at a later date. Um, but I wanted to go ahead and turn it over to Jerry Milner for closing comments. Okay. Um, once again, uh, we just want to thank everybody for taking the time um, and for having the interest to participate in, in this webinar. It's, um, it's very important for us to be able to uh, have this time with you to uh, share some of our own lessons learned here about how best to support you uh, in your efforts to uh, develop and, and to implement prevention plans that are going to serve our children and our families in the best possible ways. Uh, again, thanks so much to both Brenda and Cosette for sharing uh, your wisdom, your experience, uh, and <clears throat> we uh, 
I absolutely look forward to working with all of you, uh, um, particularly those uh, folks that uh, have, have already begun to uh, or have already submitted the plans to us, and we're working diligently to try to get those um, uh, finalized here in the um, in the short run. Uh, as uh, Elaine mentioned, we will respond to the other questions uh, that have come in, uh, which we just uh, have run out of time here uh, today on. We are, again, recording this, and we'll uh, have it posted um, uh, very quickly so that you'll have this uh, available as a resource to you. In the meantime, uh, if you should have uh, very pressing questions, please go ahead and submit those to our regional offices uh, so that we can get you responses back uh, as quickly as possible and not hold up your efforts uh, to develop your plans out there. So I believe that's it. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, this ends the call. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect at this time. I don't know how. Thank you.